prayer. Do you pray at work? If not, you should. We will be delivered. Jesus is coming back. Your dreams will be a life. LifeBridge Life Bridge Church started at a church maybe a little bit like yours. There were 70 people attending. Most of them were in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. In fact, when we interviewed there, uh, the head deacon has said, if we don't get more young people in here, our church is going to die. Why would anyone have, the re- have a reason to believe that in three and a half years, that church would have over 30 young adults involved in ministry and be sending some of them off to go plant a church in the metro area 30 minutes south? Why would anyone have reason to believe that? This is why we're here planting churches. It's not because, it's, it's not because we go by sight. It's because we go by faith that we believe in a God who has the power to create something out of nothing. Do you believe that? Do you believe God could do that in your church? Do you believe God could do that through you to create something out of nothing to reach the people that he loves? It started in a church just like this when we started, uh, when, we, when, the, the ta- when the dream started becoming a reality, we talked to another area, uh, Seventh Avenue Church, the Tacoma Central Seventh Day Avenue Church. They had tried planting a, a church the year before and it hadn't panned out how they hoped. But then we talked to them and said, hey, would you be willing to help us in this? And, the, and they said, instead of getting territorial and insecure, they said, yes, the pastor went into his, the most committed four young families and leadership that he had, and he encouraged them to come with us to plant a church. Amen? What if we collaborated together like that to send our best in order to plant and multiply more churches? What if we did that? They also said, hey, you can use our building anytime you want. As long as we're not here, you can use our building for free anytime you want. Do you think we could plant more churches if we all work together for kingdom purposes? Well, two of those families in, are still part of our, two of those families are part of our leadership team today with LifeBridge. Well, like I said before, uh, that uh, this has been something that we kind of have two parent churches that we started this process uh, officially at the end of 2019. If you think about how to plant a church, um, I'm taking this from Anthony Wagner Smith, uh, but you think about the acronym PLANT, pray and recruit, lay out vision, activate ministry, navigate worship train and send. And so we kind of set up a quarterly plan of how we were going to walk through these steps together that started in 2019. So, uh, so we prayed and recruited. We prayed that God would give us a team of 20 for our core team to start visioning. I'll be talking tomorrow in the workshop about how to recruit your team and a little bit about what we did. Um, and so we start, and then we started that visioning process, first quarter of 2020, uh, where we looked at the at what does the Bible call us to be uh, to to become? What is the what are the needs of the community? What are the gifts of the team? And where's the intersection of those three that can become our vision? And so at coming out of that, um, we saw that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to where? All nations and then the end will come. We, our mission is we want to see every person receive a meaningful invitation, emphasis on meaningful, into a Jesus-centered life. And so how's that going to happen? Is that going to happen just with the wonderful established churches that we have? No, we need to see a multiplying movement of disciples, leaders, groups, and churches, right? That's how that will happen. And so we said, okay, so now what role can we play in this? And we, and we felt called to identify who, are, who is the people group that we are going to seek to serve, empower, reach, and activate and disciple in this community. And we felt called to reach unchurched, multi-ethnic, young professional families and young professionals in University Place, Washington. It's a part of Tacoma and beyond. We want to invite them not to consume spiritual goods and services, but to live a life that changes others forever. When we talk about young people today and we wring our hands about, oh, the young people are leaving the church, blah, 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 which is not completely true anyway, but every young person I've met wants to change the world. And what they need to know is that the church is God's designated platform where they can do that. 
And when we are missional and when we're multiplying, we invite them to become part of a, a story bigger than themselves, something that will thrill them out of their minds. And so as we, as we vision together, we identified one to three key ministries we wanted to launch with. We don't need to do everything well. We don't need to reproduce what we had in the past. All we need to do is determine what are we passionate about, what could we be the best in the world at, and what's going to actually get results in making disciples, right? Right? And so at the intersection of those, we decided for us, those three focus areas are going to be health, family, and groups. We have a little bit larger team, so we could have three, right? If we have a smaller team, I'd recommend maybe one or two. And so that's, what, that's how God was leading us in our journey uh, through this process. And so as you know, we're going through this process, but what happened in about March of 2020? The pandemic! What about our plans, right? In fact, we had this great idea, you know, and, and to connect with families in the community. We were like, let's host a big community St. Patrick's Day party. It's a great idea, right? We'll wear green, we'll have green decorations, we bring green things to eat, we'll, uh, and then we'll share this true story of St. Patrick who was a Sabbath keeper, right? Sow some seeds for evangelism, creative idea, awesome idea, right? So we invite the community, we set up all the decorations and the tables, we have the games ready to go, and it's right before the lockdown. People are retreating into their homes like caves, you know, like, and, uh, and so almost nobody showed up. We had all the stuff ready, and like eight people there, When we talk about church planting, there's no such thing as a flash mob that you do the right idea in the right program and bam, everybody shows up. It's, it doesn't exist. When we talk about church planting, not everything pans out how you hope it will. But when we talk about church planting, you get to try things you never would have tried and you keep going because there's people that will be reached through that process. So what do you do? It's a pandemic. How do you plant a church in the middle of a pandemic? Well, guess what? The needs didn't stop. The mission didn't stop. Just the ways that we could do it were put on hold. So we said, hey, if we're going to be doing groups, we're not allowed to meet in homes anymore. That's illegal. And we're, very and we're not allowed to have community get-togethers. But guess what we're allowed to do? meet essential community needs. So we started a group at the Tacoma Rescue Mission to help serve uh, meals to people experiencing homelessness. And that's where we could connect together and meet the needs of other people in the community. Of course, when things open back up, we, we opened more in-home Bible study groups and stuff so that we could be discipling people into faith and discipling people into leadership. What about families? You're not allowed to do any children's programming. What do you do? Do you just say, bye kids, see you next year? No. We said, how can we support families to uh, develop their kids as servant leaders to become heroes for Jesus? And so we developed uh, kind of some kids' calendar uh, activities with challenges that kids can complete that would help build character and incentivize family worship, and then they would earn prizes and, and family devotional materials and stuff like that, and then they'd get together on Zoom and talk about it weekly so they could have accountability built in, outdoor get-togethers and stuff like that, so the kids could be growing as leaders. We don't want to train our kids to be spiritual consumers, we want to train them to be spiritual leaders, missional servant leaders. So that's why we also do things like um, provide 50 Christmas stockings to kids at the local children's hospital where we are, and we invite the community to do that with us. Uh, things like Halloween, right? A day known for darkness, we share light. And so we have children's evangelism night. All those kids come to our house, they need glow tracks. They need things about Jesus as well as other things. And the kids love dressing up and giving those out. And so we tell them, hey, you're sharing Jesus here. You're sharing light on this day. Well, we did a, a um, community fall festival during COVID. Took some creativity. Uh, but we did it. Family units stayed together. Everything was spaced out. We played by all the rules, and it was a powerful experience, and families loved it. Well, we did it again this last year. There's fewer restrictions, and uh, we hosted it at Tacoma Central Church Gym, and praise the Lord. You know what's fun about church planting? We had over 25 friends from the community there. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun when, when you have this massive group, and so what are the, what are the team members doing? They know that we're not just trying to throw events and, and, then, and then spike the football and call it a day. They know that they're connecting with these people from the community. And so that's what they're doing. I'll give you a couple examples. Well, 
Um, this this uh, family on the left, uh, she is the employee of one of our team members as an insurance branch manager. It's kind of tricky sometimes to share your faith as a boss to an employee, but what can he do? He says, you've got a kid. Why don't you bring her to the fall festival that we're having for the community over here? They come to the fall festival, and then she's like, so who's putting this on anyway? Tell me more about this. And he starts telling her about the, the church and the opportunities that there are for kids to grow to become servant leaders, right? And she says, I'm interested, right? This family in the middle up here, they found the event randomly on Facebook. The Holy Spirit must have... Uh, must have uh, stuck it in her feet or something like that. And she was interested and say, tell me more about your church. Only problem is, get this, she lived very close to Tacoma Central but didn't have a car. When she found out that our worship gathering venue is in University Place, too far to take the bus, she was, she was let down. She's like, oh, that's just too far. It's, there's not a good bus line there and everything, and we talked around, we asked around on our team, is there somebody who could give her a ride? We don't have anyone who lives in her area. We don't have anyone who's not already committed to other leadership roles and the vision that can make this their ministry. So what should we do? Should we change our vision to go help her? Should we drop her right there? Isn't it beautiful that we're part of a worldwide movement? Remember Tacoma Central was one of the mother churches or one of the parent churches uh, to plant LifeRidge? We got her connected with Tacoma Central Kids Ministry. She was, uh, if everything panned out how we planned, she would have been there this last week getting connected with the Adventure Club right there where she can be discipled and take initiative for her own discipleship journey. When we plant churches, we don't just reach people in our mission. We help connect people to other churches' mission too. Every church wins through church planting. Every church wins for the kingdom. Well, what about health? Uh, we said, what can we do? Well, of course, things are, everything in the community shut down with what your, you know, all the free services and stuff like that. We said, well, the needs haven't stopped. What can we do? Let's host a free dental clinic for the community. Well, of course, we couldn't find a venue. Nobody would let us use theirs. So one of our team members who is a dentist said, well, why don't you use mine? So we, we go and we start uh, planning having it there in uh, really kind of a terrible idea. We were planning to do it in November and do the, the dental part indoors and everything else outdoors in Washington. That's like a terrible idea, but we, you know, we're so, we're so passionate about the mission, we're like, okay, let's do it anyway. Well, God intervened. And so when we told the landlords, hey, when we got permission from the landlord to use the, the facility for the community event, they said, yeah, we actually have an extra room you guys could use if you want for part of the dental clinic. We said, oh, that sounds great. We're thinking it's gonna be like a 10 by 10 foot room. Maybe we can move something inside, have the rest out in tents and stuff. We walk in when they show us the room and it's a suite of nine different rooms in there. We're like, thank you God, this clinic can get even bigger than we thought it could. And so then we were able to, um, then we were able to move the registration in there and every patient gets prayed with at the end of their appointment. We had the chaplains in there. And then we also called the local school of dental hygiene and said, hey, would you like to bring your students to come help clean people's teeth? from the community and so we've got extra rooms and we got mobile dental units that we could serve so we could end up serving all, almost a hundred people uh, with free dental care in the middle of the pandemic. Now like I said it's not just about throwing events and feeling good about it it's about connecting with people and making disciples. So our leader so that means a couple things number one we want 50 to 70 percent of the volunteers when we serve for the community for fall fest for all these kind of things uh, free health clinics, we want 50 to 70% of the volunteers to be our, our people. And we want the rest of them to be from the community because, so that they can serve with us in that experience and we can grow relationships with them. So our team members know that not only am I carrying out my service role here, but my main objective is to pray that God will get me connected to one to three patients or volunteers that I can listen to a piece of their story, I can, follow, I can get their contact info, and I can follow up with a missional friendship in a relevant way to them. Right? And so that's what we do. Well, one of the patients who came through, she comes to Alex, and during the prayer time, it's, we pray with every patient. Here's how it goes. We say, how was your experience today? And they're always like, it was amazing. Thank you so much. And then we say, what can we pray for for you? And then they open up and start, start sharing all kinds of stuff about their life. Well, this mom, this young mom who her husband's a, a professional, they're unchurched, she, she starts telling about how she grew up in a family 
with, uh, they taught her to believe in God and to pray, but they never read the Bible. They never taught her anything about God. They weren't connected to any church. And so she's taught that to her kids now to believe in God and to pray. And they're asking questions like, well, what, who is God? What's God like? And she's like, well, actually, I don't really know. And Alex, our team member says, I think we can help you with that. And so Alex says, can I get your contact info? And she follows up. And, she, and so the next week they say, hey, can I, hey, do you want to go for a walk together? Hey, do you want to go hang out together? Then they share a meal together. And then they find a way to bless them in some way. And then they build this missional friendship. And then Alex asks, hey, would you, get, would you be interested in you and your kids doing some Bible studies? And the mom says, that would be great. But Alex is a disciple maker. She doesn't just start doing the Bible study. She says, who else can I get involved in this process so I can train up a new disciple maker? And so then she, she finds another family that's part of the LifeBridge team with a kids who are just a little bit older than these kids. And so now Jaden, the guy in the orange shirt, is leading the Bible study for the kids. So the family is now discipling the new unchurched family into the faith, right? That was one of the coolest Bible studies I've ever been part of, led by a 13-year-old with unchurched, with an unchurched family right there. And it, I was just like, praise the Lord for church planting, right? Don't we want this for our kids? We don't need to try to keep our kids in church. We need, the world to, needs to try to keep our kids from being the church over there. Another dental, one of the dental hygiene students who served with us, uh, Yesenia, was um, uh, she and her husband, when they got married, they decided they were done with religion for the rest of their life. Um, they'd had negative experiences in their previous churches. He was Catholic. She was Assemblies of God. And so she's, they said, you know, we're just, we just don't need this in our life. Until she shows up to serve at a LifeBridge Church free dental clinic. She sees, wow, I can't believe that this church is doing this for this community. And they say it's because this is what Jesus was all about. And I'm meeting these kind people. We invite her to continue journeying with us. And she does. And, uh, and so she joins one of our online Bible study groups at the time during COVID. And as she studies the word and discusses with us, God starts making changes in her life. And she says, when the changes started happening in my life, things started moving that I'd been wanting to see moved. I knew God was calling me to become part of LifeBridge Church. Praise the Lord. Who you involve is who you reach. Can you say that? One, two, three. Who you involve is who you reach. We need to stop programming for people and start serving with people. All right. Um, my time is almost up, so I'm going to skip through some stuff really fast. Maybe I'll throw it in tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, um, one of the biggest keys that anyone can do is it's not just about the big events. It's not just about the bells and whistles. Is every member committing to live out discipleship, missional discipleship rhythms in their life? This is one that we like and we hold ourselves accountable to. Bless three people per week, at least one not from your church. Eat with three people per, le per week, at least one not from your church. Listen to the Holy Spirit and to others. Learn Christ each day and then identify yourself as being sent to share the ways you've been sent by God each week. And, and so in our leadership team meeting, we spend time... Uh, sharing Bell's stories, right? That's the acronym, sharing stories about who we've been discipling and investing in in, in that journey. Do you have to have all, this, all the, the gifting in the world to be able to do this, yes or no? Anybody can make a huge difference in the mission doing this one thing. And if you're doing this one thing, you're going to create a need for Bible studies and for groups and evangelistic series and service events and other things and worship gatherings, right? If we're living out the mission in our individual lives. I'm going to close out here with, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff I could share, but that's for another day. Um, but we'd been worshiping in uh, Tacoma Central Gym on Sabbath afternoons, and uh, we started a family worship um, there in the mornings. But uh, this last Sabbath, we just had our first Sabbath in our new rented worship venue of our own in University Place. We praise God for that. Amen. We're so pumped. And like we said before, it's not a cakewalk. We searched over 20 places before we found this one. We got, we got one that looked like a yes, and they came back two months later and told us no, right when we thought it was time. Oh, that's my timer. All right. So 
we, it was, and so through that process, you know, okay, I got to tell one quick story on myself as I'm closing. We, we, for, we go to this one church that we think is going to be the spot to rent. They say, he, the pastor says, oh yeah, this should be good. Just give me a month. I'll talk to my leadership team and my staff and all that. They come back and he comes back and he's like, yeah, this should be, this should be all set. Just give me a couple more weeks. And then he calls me back and says, actually, the staff and the board voted unanimously. It's a no-go. You can't use the place. I was kind of devastated. I went to my team and I was like, oh man, we almost had it. We were kind of set, ready to go. And now... Now we don't have this place. And one of my team members, praise the Lord for her, said, I'm so excited about this. I was like, what is wrong with you, right? She said, I'm so excited about this. This means that God has a better place for us. And I was like, you're right. Why am I worried about this? Jesus said, I will build my church. And he can handle any, any challenge that comes our way because it's his mission and he's got people that he's going to save through you. Let's do it.